Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai, haramai, and welcome to the eighth online hui hosted by PANS and Auckland Live. Ko Delina wihi peihana tō kuingoa he uri aho no Ngāti Tukorehe, me Ngāti Raukawa. It's my pleasure to be here this morning to facilitate this hui as we discuss level one and what's happening out there during this time. I'd like to begin our session with a karakia. Me karakia tātou. Tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro. Tu tawa mai i roto, tu tawa mai i waho. Kia tau ai te mauri tu, te mauri ora ki te katoa, haumia hui e, taiki e. So here we are at level one, and a huge congratulations and ngā mihi to all of you for making it through the lockdown and for the incredible situation we find ourselves in here where we have no COVID cases currently in the country, a huge difference to what is happening in other places overseas. So now we're here in level one, we have no restrictions on gatherings, so we are good to go, or are we? Our arts industry really ground to a halt. How quickly are we really able to get back going? Plus we've acknowledged that there is no going back to the way things were before. We are all seeking a new normal with all the issues that rose to the surface, the beautiful reflections and thoughts that have been shared in our hui over the last two months. How are we readjusting our practices as artists and organizations and exactly how do we reopen, start presenting or performing or touring again? I'm joined by three brilliant panelists this morning representing venues and companies from Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. We'd love to hear from you also during the panel. If you have any questions or comments that you'd like to share with our panelists, please do enter them into the comments and our wonderful team behind the scenes, Louise, Heather and Helena will collate those for us and I can ask those questions to our panelists. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our first panelist this morning, Anna Cameron. Anna Cameron is the Executive Director of Auckland Theatre Company. She hails from Whangarei and has 28 years of experience in the New Zealand art sector. Anna has held a variety of roles across the arts and creative industries. Before relocating to Auckland in 2016 to take up a role in the Arts and Culture Unit at Auckland Council, Anna was resident in Wellington for 14 years she was the Head of Programming at the New Zealand International Arts Festival, the Manager of Public Programs and Education at City Gallery, and she worked at the British Council, semi-permanent and was the Director of Play Market. Anna's background is in theatre performance, direction and producing, and she was the founding producer of Massive Theatre Company. Anna is committed to the development and sustainability of cultural and creative life for all New Zealanders. Welcome, Anna. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Delina. Kei te pēhia koutou. I'm sitting here in my home in Auckland. I'm in a room that's sort of tacked onto the side of our house. It's sort of a shed-like situation. Thank you, PANS, Auckland Live, and the big idea for holding these hui. I'd like to acknowledge uh, all of the speakers who have shared their wisdom. There is such a collective richness from our sector to draw upon at this time. I salute my fellow panelists this morning and I look forward to our kōrero. Having catapulted into level one, our topic today is who is ready to move, who is doing what? For this hui, I've been asked to represent Auckland Theatre Company in my role as Executive Director. This morning, I'm going to tell you what ATC is up to. I'll spend a little time talking about the online space and I'll round off with some thoughts about being an employer at this time and share some thinking about the company of the future. In order to look forward, we've got to look back. So I'm going to dip back into level four Rahui to explain some of the ways that we have been able to keep moving during this precarious time. I was really struck by Poor Wai Kens from Te Papa, who spoke some weeks ago at one of these hui. Poor Wai 
talked about this being the age of precarious and she underscored the need and the importance of moving at the pace of our most vulnerable and her thinking has really stayed with me and I've been turning those ideas over so if you're there Paul Wai, we don't know each other, but thank you. You've given us a lot to think about. American science fiction author, Octavia Butler says, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Already the past six plus weeks spent at level four feels like the distant past, such as the rush back to level one. As level three and level four took hold, ATC canceled the remainder of Stanley Makue's play Black Lover, which was playing a sellout season at Q Loft. We pulled our touring company off the road halfway through a North Island tour of Roger Hall's Winding Up. We canceled four of the seven shows in our 2020 main bill season. We canceled our creative learning, youth arts and new works programs, and we closed the ASB Waterfront Theatre. The ASB Waterfront Theatre is a 675 seat venue. It's located in Auckland's Wynyard Quarter and it's the theatre that ATC built and opened in 2016. As level four craziness ramped up, we were very fortunate to be able to respond to a fantastic idea put forward by theatre director Eleanor Bishop for an online Zoom adaptation of Chekhov's The Seagull, co-written by Eleanor Bishop and Eli Kent. It took us two weeks from Yes, We're In to the first episode, which aired on Friday the 8th of May. The creative team who put this together were brilliant in every way. And the result was true innovation of the theater form using a current online communications platform. Both critical response and audience engagement confirmed that The Seagull was a very successful collaboration. Audience engagement over a five week period saw 33,200 views of The Seagull. Now, as a hypothetical comparison, I've just been doing this little exercise if we ran the Seagull at the ASB Waterfront Theatre for a five week season, let's say at six shows a week, so that would be 30 performances of the work. And if we sold that season at 100%, that would be 20,250 people. The online Zoom version of the Seagull achieved a 64% increase in audiences in my hypothetical comparison. And that's based on a hypothetical comparison at 100% and 30 live shows as a season, which is something we would never do in the current climate or potentially ever. So we're still very much unpacking what this recent online experiment means. And I'm just gonna dwell on this topic for a moment. The debate about how to protect value and monetize our art on screen is firmly at play. I think this is, the seriousness of this debate is perhaps yet to be grappled with because this is very new territory for many artists and organizations whose livelihood is built on the live experience. As we ready ourselves to develop new business models, it feels as though we are in a place of experimentation and discovery right now. And perhaps we would do well to stay here for a bit longer, give ourselves space to test ideas, build trust with new audiences, start new conversations about online engagement, 
learn from each other and test out what feels right for our brands. In a level four context with the National Theatre of Great Britain offering their plays for free online and it being the very first online production that ATC has produced, The Seagull was offered free for global public consumption on YouTube and Facebook and all four episodes can be viewed until the 3rd of July. I'm going to move on now to some of the other things that we have planned for 2020 at Level 1. In the mode of repurposing, ATC Artistic Director Colin McColl is currently rehearsing the Master Builder Company to produce a filmed studio version of this Ibsen classic for distribution online. Last week, we announced a Back on the Boards Spring Mini Festival at the ASB Waterfront Theatre for September. Featuring DF Mamia's celebratory work, Still Life with Chickens, with Goretti Chadwick and Hans Fa'avai Jackson, uh, directed by Fasi Toa Amosa, and a return season of Stanley Makue's Black Lover, with Cameron Rhodes and Simba Rashi Mache, uh, directed by Roy Ward. There will be further announcements around a new third piece to complete the Back on the Boards Festival trio. We are proceeding with our November production of Hedwig and the Angry Inch, directed by Shane Bosher. Awesome. Our creative learning team, under the leadership of Associate Director Lynn Cardi, has been really busy repurposing the year's work to keep engagement high with schools and the next generation of theatre makers. Our youth arts coordinator, Mile Fane, developed and led a project called 100-ish Word Plays, and it invited submissions from young writers to have their work published on Instagram, and we were absolutely swamped with submissions. Our new works team, under the leadership of literary manager Philippa Campbell and artistic director Colin McColl, have continued to work with playwrights and theatre makers to keep the development flame alive during this time. We had the pleasure of working with the North Island Venue Consortium of four theatre venues in Hastings, Hamilton, New Plymouth and Tauranga to tour Roger Hall's Winding Up. And we're continuing to have uh, conversations and investigate touring possibilities with the Venue Consortium for this year and for next year. And fortunately, it seems appetite for touring seems to be returning and conversations are on the go again for other works. As part of our operation at the ASB Waterfront Theatre, we work with a range of arts partners, including the Auckland Arts Festival, New Zealand International Film Festival, Royal New Zealand Ballet, New Zealand Opera, Pacific Dance New Zealand, New Zealand Dance Company, Black Grace and Footnote, as well as a range of other partners. We also work with a range of corporate clients who conduct events at the theatre. And I'm pleased to report that the phone is starting to ring again and planning is underway once more. We all have a very challenging 2021 ahead as we pick up the pieces of our respective crystal balls and glue them back together to try and predict what audiences will do. How will people respond to live theatre once again? 2021 also brings some large scale goodness back into the economy and the events landscape with Te Matatini, AC America's Cup 36, AC 36, Women's Rugby World Cup and APEC Leaders Week. It feels like a big part of level one is about reconnection, re-emergence, showing up for each other and connecting with purpose and intention. Perhaps our days of meetings for the sake of meetings are coming to an end. The final part of my presentation today is around supporting people through change. Throughout COVID, I've had many conversations with sector colleagues about the responsibility and the challenge of being an employer at this time, 
and there are so many aspects to this, but in short, how do we create the best environment for our teams, our partners, and the sector so that the business of the arts and our artists working on all levels can thrive? I've been asking myself, what will theatre do amidst this very complicated context? Globally, we are working through a pandemic, a race relations crisis, and the issue that defines our planet right now, climate change is evolving daily. Nationally, many organizations are moving through structural change and we are all repurposing ourselves and our businesses and finding ways through. Our professional and personal lives have become intertwined in new and challenging ways. Our communications technologies and the sheer range of platforms may be exhausting us. The interdependencies of our physical, mental, cultural, spiritual and societal well-beings sees us needing to put on our own oxygen masks first whilst simultaneously looking after others. Some initial practical things that we've been able to do at ATC are to establish an employee assistance program for our staff and for all of our creative teams, contractors and casuals uh, who work with us. ATC employs hundreds of people throughout the year. This service offers free confidential 24-7 counselling support, um, as well as a range of other services. In the same breath, we joined together with the New Zealand Festival Comedy Trust and Auckland Live to support the wider arts sector to have access to the Music Helps Wellbeing Service, which is available now to anyone working in the arts in Aotearoa. A lockdown forces retreat, a bizarre hibernation, qualities of being insular, introspective, quiet, yet still an impetus to show ourselves to each other and open up new conversations we've been meaning with people that we've been meaning to talk to for the longest time. As we open up again, and re-engage and present ourselves once more to the outside world, there is a new importance on mindfulness and consciousness and language to co-create our new world together. The scarcity of resources is upon us now. So, how we use our human capital is critical. The world is asking us to become more adaptable, more flexible, more nimble, more resilient. And we want choices with that and simpler strategies to make our well being a priority. I've been engaging with the work of a couple of Danish designers. Lars Korland and Jacob Botter, who together with 10 writers gathered in Budapest eight years ago to write a book in one week. And the book is called Unboss. And it speaks about the company of the future will be an unlimited movement. Today, knowledge, purpose and collaboration rather than hierarchy, competition, and a bottom line only focus, make the difference between success and failure. The UNBOSS idea is that businesses must first and foremost be useful. They must become movements that change the world. Of course, the humanities have been doing this for centuries, and we are perfectly positioned 
if not a little disrupted, to keep on unlocking the true potential of the arts, but leave behind the non-useful and the non-relevant. Chief Executive Officer of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, Deborah Cullinan says, the intersections of relevance is where the great art lives. In his poem, The Art of Walking Upright, Glenn Colquhoun says, the art of walking upright here is the art of using both feet. One is for holding on, one is for letting go. Nō reira, tēnei te mihi aroha ki a koutou katoa. Kia ora, Anna. E mihi ana ki a koe mō tō kōrero. What a beautiful way to start the panel this morning with that amazing kōrero. I'm struck by what you're saying about co-creating the new world and the idea of the unboss, the non-hierarchy, the unpatterning that we can do, the reshaping and reforming that we need to do in collective ways. But boy, can that sometimes be hard when you're coming up against the conditioning, you know, the long-standing conditioning of the way that we function and operate as businesses, as art structures, the processes and policies that we've put in place can be very difficult to change. And it is wonderful to hear your thoughts on that as perhaps we're moving to a time where our true values in the world can come to play, the values of freedom and change and liberation. So thank you very much, Anna, for your quarter all this morning. I'd like to introduce our next panelist this morning, wonderful friend of mine, Tane Mahuta Gray. Tane is currently the Kahukura Kai Arataki Toy, the CEO and Artistic Director of Takirua Productions. And he also recently held the role of Kai Rotaki Māori Strategic Advisor Māori for Tāwhiri and the New Zealand Festival of the Arts. Tani Mahuta has 26 years of professional experience as an event producer, theatre director and choreographer of over 25 events, festivals and productions, including the Oceania work at the Shanghai World Expo opening ceremony. He has guest choreographed the South Pacific Aotearoa section of WOW World of Wearable Art since 2010 as well as co-produced and artistically directed New Zealand's largest scale bicultural productions, including Maui, One Man Against the Gods, Aroha Nui, The Greatest Love, and Tiki Tane Mahuta. Tane Mahuta spent five years performing for the Argentinian aerial theatre company De La Guarda in London, Las Vegas, Buenos Aires, Amsterdam, Berlin, Seoul, and Sydney, and in 2018 choreographed a Broadway musical workshop lab of Otherworld, in New York. Kia ora and welcome Tane. Uh, kia ora tō Lena, uh, nā mihi anō uh, ki te whānau whānui i tēnei wā, uh, pirangi ki te tūtai ki te mi uh, ki o, ma, i o matu i te kore i o te wānanga, ki a ranginui rawa ko papa atu anuku a me hoki nga atu i runga rawa, i tēnei wā pirangi ki te mihi ake. Uh, kia rātou uh, nā tini mate, nā tini ai tuai i tēnei wā, i roti te wā o te mate urutā o te mate korauna, haere, haere, haere atu rā e moi mai rā. Apetiono tātai hono tonga mate hoki ki a rātau, apetiono tātai hono tonga ora ki tonga ora. Ki te whānau whānui o PANS, uh, Auckland Live, uh, uh, The Big Idea, uh, me um, uh, Auckland nei kai kōrua i tēnei wā ko Anna, uh, me, me hoki ko Michael, kei te mi ki a kōrua. Uh, kia ora te whānau, um, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to come and share in this uh, wonderful wānanga that PANS and Auckland Live have been hosting over these weeks while we've been in lockdown and now into Alert Level 1 and what a journey it's been for us all. Um, for me, where am I? I'm in my uh, kind of lounge dining room at the moment, that's been my home bubble uh, space, we call it Puangiangi, or well, Korokuipu, um, and um, in behind that space, um, got a little bit of redecorating in, the, in, the, in our funny hair, so taking it from a bit of a 70s feel into a little bit more modern look, so um, we're still in the middle of that process, which is lockdown's been really great to get ahead of that, so it's been wonderful for us. Um, what I wanted to do was share with you some of the 
some of the processes that Takirua have been doing uh, from level four and then moving to level one uh, with our, our core business activities, our outreach to our communities, and also the cope up of um, bringing back ourselves to live performance. Um, just to start off with, I thought um, I'd share with you that right actually from the outset, um, we had quite a strong, I, for me and my team at Takirua had a strong commitment to believe that we'll be presenting live again in 2020 after um, and, and really had a lot of hope in our country and our team of 5 million that we would make uh, the steps and advancement to do that. We're a live performance uh, theatre company, kanohi kita kanohi face to face, we make massive impact in the whole world of wellbeing of our communities when we're with them and we didn't want to um, divert uh, completely our energy uh, into just an online process on that front. So our whakaata was um, pushing hard on that. And I know Rachel Mazza from Elbidjeri had the same thinking on whakaata as well. So it's been interesting sharing those thoughts with our Indigenous um, theatre makers and our brothers and sisters in Canada and Australia. Um, the For us, um, opening up in level one has started with um, opening with Tahoe Kainga. Tahoe Kainga is our, our hub, our Māori, our Māori, Māori space, which has a rehearsal space and also offices. Um, in that time of Tahoe Kainga being opened up, we've had um, Tawata Productions and the Conch and ourselves opened it up together. And then we've now also got Tahoe Tutu, uh, which is a producing house of um, uh, young uh, producers and uh, emerging and established producers uh, presenting their works. Um, and at that stage, I want to acknowledge Nancy Brunning, of course, not with us anymore, but she was one of our Hotutu Farmo uh, with Harpai Productions in that space, alongside Inna, Inna Daniels, um, Helena H.J. Uh, Kilkelly, and then also um, Mitch Tuffy Thomas. Uh, we've also had the Māori Side Steps in Tikapa, uh, with Jamie McCaskill in the space as well with us at the Hokainga. So we've had a lovely hub um, um, experience of Māori production companies and then um, also the Performance Arcade spent, has spent some time with us. And lots of um, the community in the last four years have been with us um, and using it as a rehearsal space as well. So having that community space closed down and let level four um, has been a challenge, a real challenge. Um, but on the other front, it's also provided us opportunities to realise that we can work from home and that we can work successfully from home in our little home bubbles. Um, and that process, um, once we got to alert level two, though, uh, we really wanted to be able to open up for our office leases uh, to be able to get back into their offices um, to Hokainga. And it had quite a series of um, just the practical elements um, for opening up again in a, in a COVID um, in a COVID environment. So uh, for to Hokainga, we worked it so we had two staff on every day, um, opening up from ten to four o'clock, and. As part of that process, we've got a whole contract tracing system in Tahoe Kainga, um, uh, and this will utilise onwards because it's useful um, to have this for earthquakes, for any other um, emergencies that may happen. We know who's in the building and we know who's not. So that's been a, a nice uh, perk for us to have that set up and established and, and also to know who in the whānau is coming in and, um, and when new whānau come in into Tahoe Kainga, we can get the, their connections and who they are um, and, and build our, our whānau broader and wider. Um, it's just stronger hygiene practices. Um, we had started this before um, we got into lockdown anyway, and um, because in the process of when COVID came through, we were in the middle of our Te Reo Māori season tour, which we did two weeks of the five-week tour before we had to bring that down in, in the middle of the Auckland Festival. And then um, we also had to cancel developments of um, shows for our Te Reo Māori season for 2021 because it was over the COVID lockdown period. Um, our, our, but our main focus uh, within Te Hukainga and our teams was to see if we could get our shows back up and live and really employ the big amount, biggest amount of contractors that we do do and look after it over Takirua. Um, so in terms of Tahu Kainga, stronger hygiene practices, uh, putting uh, protocols in place, right down even to um, we stopped using the dishwasher. And so everyone who used their dishes, finished it, dried it, put them away. So it was all set for the next person to do it. So it was a way of manaki looking after the space for the next person. Um, so the, the, the whole water kina whangata, health for the well-being of our people was always set up in, 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 in place. So trying to um, um, put that dynamic in the, in the space so that everyone was preparing it for the next person to utilise and keeping it um, clean and ready for, for, that, for those practices to keep ourselves healthy and safe. Um, we have uh, an exciting time now that we've actually got our first um, um, activity happening uh, this coming Wednesday with the um, Arts Wellington. I've got the action plan agenda that they're promoting. So that'll be uh, presented at Te Hukainga. So that'll be our first time with a, a bigger group of people. So that's going to be really um, exciting for us to um, be able to manage that, that, that next process um, 
we're an elite level one, but it's where's the confidence of our community? That's the, the big challenge, I think, that we're all discovering now as to um, how open are our audiences and our communities as we go into live performance. So um, that's a very exciting time for us at Toho Kainga that we've got there. And then in a week and a half's time after that, we start our rehearsals for a, um, our first contracted show was Sing To Me, uh, written by Alex Lodge and directed by Midiama McDowell. Um, this show, we continued right through lockdown. So working with the creative team of Jane Hakaraya on set and lights, um, um, to Uda Hoskins, who's our costume designer, and Dai Butler, our sound designer. Uh, we worked um, through the whole um, design element with Midiama and the team to um, keep that, that show going forward. It was in a partnership with Centerpoint to present uh, in July, early July. Um, we obviously were in a place where we couldn't commit then and neither could Centerpoint to be ready and open at that stage. So what then we did is readjusted our budgets and just looked at, we're looking at rehearsals for the show and um, and making sure that the actors, Kali Kopai, Scotty Cotton, Cotter, as well as the creative team um, work is being created, developed and ready in preparation for touring next year. So it's exciting that we can keep these shows on the ball, building ready for future touring. Um, for us in the rehearsals, um, the protocol is how do we build a whole water, a safe environment for those who are rehearsing in the building who are going to be in much more closer proximity potentially than those just in the offices, in the office space, um, and the physicality that happens with rehearsals. And I think the um, um, elements for us was that um, the uh, had that thought of creating a rehearsal bubble of our whānau in there and that bubble just being really aware of where they go to when they are um, uh, in their external time out and what they're bringing back into that bubble as well. Even though we're in a place where it's all um, no limits now in terms of that space, it's just being really aware so that contract tracing wise we have everything in place to know where we've been, what we're doing. Um, it's a, for us, uh, there's that key responsibility because New Zealand has done an incredible job. It's just so amazing how we've eradicated the virus. So I think in three, four days, we'll have a, um, if no more results, 28 days, we'll be at full eradication, um, which is such an impressive um, feat to achieve when you look at what's happening around the world. And it's because of that that we're in a position to look at um, opening live as well, which is um, really exciting. So for us, it's how do we just keep it so we have that, that, space strong safe and build that confidence for then our audiences to come through our other thread we have is our Tiro Māori season um, this is the show that we tour to schools and Kurokopapa all around the country and this show um, is where we reach thousands of our tamariki and our rangatahi and keep Te Reo Māori um, alive and well um, for our, our communities mainstream and Kurokopapa uh, to share. Uh, we're doing Namanu Roreka which is written by Apirana Taylor and translated by Matero Hainga and uh, was directed by Wanita Hippie from down south so connection with uh, Michael and their little Andromeda whānau because Wanita does some work with them too. Um, our, um, in terms of this process, we've been working, we, we worked from even before COVID really became a big issue, we knew it was going to be an issue from January. So, and we knew as a team of five touring around from school to school, that we could be an infecting hive, going into hive to hive to school. So we really felt that we were going to be a potential um, challenge for that. First phase for us in that was a, a process called uh, Tauparudu. Uh, Tauparudu is a process of um, when we have porphyry with each other, we hongi, the greeting with the nose, shake hands, and the exchange of breath, which obviously in a COVID-19 scenario is complete um, um, infection um, spreading in a, in a big way. Um, so what we then uh, put into place with advice from mana whenua who made the call that Tauparudu, um, an element of porphyry was to happen with no hongi, no exchange of hands, just arrival at place. So that was put in place over the COVID period and um, that uh, we had that experience come through with the New Zealand Festival of the Arts, Paul Fiddy, where we had Hongi for the first two and then Topaduru for the third Hongi onwards. Um, the process for that for us is um, just keeping our community and our cast all safe. Um, even though we're in this alert space and uh, Te Atiawa, Taranaki Whanau, we have now provided the opportunity for Topaduru to stop and people to do Hongi again, but they've also said the commitment is Kaya Koto to Tikanga it is up to you whether you feel safe yet or not to do that. And we do feel as we're going from school to school and community to community, that it's best in this light of, for the rest of the 2020 tour that we do not um, do, do um, topadudu in that phase. So that was the first part of our whole water policy. 
Um, the second element for us is because we'll be going to schools from the 20th of July, and what's been fantastic is 75% thus far have of the schools have said, yes, we do want you coming back, um, which is a real confidence boost for us, mainly because we had 23 school shows uh, cancel in two days um, when we were right in the middle of Auckland Festival, which was the writing on the wall of the end of the rest of the tour, and then the alert levels moved to level three and level four. Um, was that um, at least there is that confidence and a need coming from the teachers. We believe that this is good for their tamariki, the rangatahi, with the journey that they've had uh, to have live experiences. But part of our process is to make sure that we've got a four to five metre gap from where we perform to where the um, um, students are sitting to experience the show, to try and create those distances, those gaps, um, again, because um, we have that potential to be a, um, a hive going into another hive. Um, for us, it's the um, also promoting strong hygiene practices within our whanau and making sure that um, we are as clean and, um, and, and, and practical in our safety hygiene practices as possible to, to make sure that we're um, touring from school to school um, as safely as possible. We also undertake main stage touring and um, the Sing To Me um, uh, presentation at Centre Point, obviously we've, we've had to cancel, so we're looking um, to go straight into touring with that next year. Um, but we have a, the potential to do Pohutu, uh, which is our main stage touring co-papa. And it's, a, it's an interesting position, this one, because we're in a situation where uh, financially the bo gross box office income and the um, other resources that are available through Trust and Foundation have really uh, diminished massively, as is uh, sponsorship and that. So it's a very different environment environments to want to then be able to continue um, effectively uh, to make um, uh, live stage work and touring work, which is, is expensive to do, um, getting it out to our regions and our communities. So um, that's uh, uh, we're, in a, we're in a place where we're still waiting on results to see if that's possible or whether we will be forced to um, postpone that to next year. So it's, a, it's the element of a lot of us, uh, the production companies are having to work through how do we navigate the multiple pathways and plans, plan A, B, C and D. Um, and different scenarios of how can we make work happen and how do we also look after our artists in that process and that's an ongoing dialogue and it's it's not easy I, I can definitely attest to that and you feel the heart of so many of our freelancers who um, their livelihood is this and um, if they're not performing or not presenting stuff that's a big part and chunk of their um, livelihood gone so that's a big responsibility on us totara and kahikatea um, for us, that's been a, a big part of our hauora, uh, kinga tangata, uh, for our contractors is our commitment, so as, as with CNZ's brilliant moves of the emergency relief funds that they've been providing um, for artists uh, for the, um, the, the activity and, and new programs and ideas and then support for Tōtara and Kaikatea to make sure that up to the 30th of June, we honour all those contracts. So those um, artists who were um, uh, committed through contracting, regardless of whether it happened or not, we're going to be um, um, unpaid and supported through that. So that's been a big um, co-papa and awesome co-papa for us to continue to continue in that advocacy and support. Other elements which we've been doing with Takirua is really getting to um, work with our other Māori um, organisations, theatre and dance. So Atamira Tawata Productions, um, Dillian, of course, uh, who work at PANS and Auckland Festival, um, and um, Te Pau um, and... Um, the um, Te Paira Awhiti Festival Tama Waipara as well. Um, all these whānau have been working strongly together to really work out how can we outreach to our artists and provide A, the knowledge of what funds are available in terms of the um, MSD um, subsidy, wage subsidy, plus also the CNC relief grants, and then um, also what support can we give to our artists um, to know about what's available, but also Tanga and Manaki, how do we uplift and look after our whānau and keep those community links there. And in that process, we re-established um, He Waka Urungi, which is a kaupapa that Nancy Browning set up um, back out of the National Māori Theatre Hui. And that's talking to different uh, regional leaders around the Motu just to get a sense of how are different regions um, um, coping with the Māori theatre uh, right across the Motu. So we get a bit more data, a bit more information of how, of how people are doing um, as, um, from, from directly from the mouths of those who are um, leaders in the, those areas. Um, we also had artist catch-ups, which we all um, balanced in our timetables between Atamita Dance Company, Te Pau, ourselves at Takirua, Tawata, um, to be able to really make sure that our communities that we're working with are 
um, uh, had that chance to fuck off a tanga touch base through our Zamanga Zui, our 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 our, and our Zui, our our Zoom. It was just fantastic that way that we were able to keep in touch with our our teams via Zoe and realize that yes, it's not face to face, but you still can uh, create a lovely connection even in this uh, new environment that we're in. So that was really um, exciting for us to know that. And then also just advocacy lobbying, had an opportunity with Meg Williams to lobby for uh, more funding from the government for 26 more million is what we were lobbying for. And we've got 25 million. So hopefully that helped in us getting that across the line from the government. And we know more will be needed to um, allow the arts to navigate through this next phase. Um, but I think we've been well um, looked after by the government um, more than I've seen in, since 20 years ago with Helen um, Clark's recovery package for the arts. Um, the thing for us in terms of wanting to get live performance up was a big thing for me is just the ecology. Um, I um, have certainly heard that um, uh, production and technical production companies have um, had to let go of a lot of their workers and are down to very small um, kaimahi workers nowadays and, and, and employees. And so for us, for me, one of those personal elements is getting back into live allows our lighting companies, our tech companies to have at least other clients helping them keep them and trying to keep them alive and trying to get through the hub. My, one of my thinkings is potential that could happen is in the success that New Zealand's had, we may get a lot of films coming over here. I've heard 40 films are considering coming, um, the option of coming in and, and shooting in, in New Zealand, which would be amazing for the work that um, artists can have and continue work. But also for the, it's, a, it's a challenge for the live theatre um, industry because a lot of our talent will go um, to places where they can be better paid, better supported. So it's a, a, for me, it's that element of how do we become resilient and robust and also work with the emerging talent so that we build a bigger bubble of, of um, stronger work, stronger opportunities for our artists coming through. But I, I believe the well-being that this country has created will actually become the best part of building our economy. Uh, people will look to want to come and live in New Zealand build work in New Zealand because they can't do that in the States. Hollywood, I believe, will be closed for a year and a half or two, um, the way things are going. So I think the opportunities are significant and exciting for Aotearoa, for New Zealand. Um, just wanted to finish off with just the digital connections. So we have, we decided not to put any shows online, um, online um, live or existing shows, except for our Te Māori season from 2016, um, mainly because we didn't have the, the quality of footage to be able to do that. So we made that a, a call not to do that at this stage. Um, it does mean that in our plannings, we'll make sure that we do have good quality footage and um, not just archival footage that we can put up on, on that as an opportunity. But I did also have questions about if everything's going out for free, where do we move here? Because this mistake that the um, press have made um, in terms of providing online free um, um, uh, um, articles and press articles has meant a lot of them are struggling nowadays as well. So how does the arts navigate that? And there was a, a good article I read on the Arts Aotearoa um, COVID-19 site on Facebook that um, discussed that point. Um, and that's the conversation. This is what Anna mentioned, is what we're needing to be having now. But for us, we thought, oh, there's uh, a nice way to connect into people's bubbles, people's homes. So we, we created a process of uh, te reo i te kainga. So, uh, uh, what language can you use, Thrill Māori can you use in your home bubbles, in your home situations that you're um, working from? So um, our new uh, marketing coordinator, Kai Whakataranga Taylor Terakia, um, did that for us. We've also got Māori games, Nakoruru, like knuckle bones and that coming through on online offerings as well for our rangatahi uh, to be able to um, have um, fun with us in a whare tāpere process of amusement games, um, being able to provide those options for our tamariki. Um, we've also been able to keep our te reo Māori classes alive via Zui and Peta Kirikiri, our um, uh, tutor, um, has been able to maintain our um, intermediate, advanced and beginner classes. Um, and it's been lovely being able to stay in touch with those who would normally come to Tahukainga for classes with us to be able to do that by, by the Wānanga. So that's been great. And then just those Zui Zānanga and the Zui Hui that we've been having um, with our artists, our contracting teams, just keeping people connected and um, getting the um, element of a, a continuity of connect connection and that works are progressing forwards. So I think that's the confidence that we've been needing to to really make that work strongly. Um, but in the end, it's gonna be confidence. How do we make sure that we um, are working with our theatres that we're looking to partner with, 
what's the numbers that we want to be able to create inside a, 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 um, a scenario where they feel as an audience there's enough space within um, those places and we build that confidence back to um, being able to um, share in live theatre and have that full energy that you have which is um, you can't experience on screen um, of um, being inside a theatre space together with your audience the show, the performers, and the messages that can really resonate so strongly in that, in the, in that, the platform that we love. So that's our next part of the journey, and we're really looking forward to trying to navigate that process. Norere kia koutou katoa, nei te whakatauki o te wā, e hāri te toa takitahi, engari he toa takitini e. It is not the um, uh, thoughts of just one that's going to make it, it's going to be the thoughts of us and the mahi of us all working together that'll help us navigate this through together through COVID-19. Thank you very much for that rundown. Amazing to hear about all of Takirua's many varied activities. Fantastic to hear that you're about to be back in the studio developing and rehearsing new work and that your tour is able to go ahead later this year with Ngā Manu Rōreka, your Te Reo Māori season. Really fingers crossed for you that you're able to start touring your other work as well, because as you point out, that whole ecosystem uh, of the venues and the theatre companies, we're all going to be relying on each other to be able to bring the um, activities back to life across the art sector. I'm feeling hopeful seeing the numbers of people that were out and about to the rugby matches on the weekend, that people will feel the appetite to be regathering to come to the theatres as well. But of course, there's many other um, things that are at play, such as accessibility, um, ticket price at this time of a recession, and then of course, the ability for all of us to find the funding to be able to present the work. Um, thank you, Tane. Also, I really just wanted to acknowledge the thinking and thought process that you have put into Ho Order for the Tangata, for the well-being of your people, the systems and processes that you've thought of and developed during level two within your plan A to Z plans um, and the things that you're going to continue and take forth into level one and just ongoing with your practice. Um, also, just referring to the leadership that you said that Te Atiawa showed in terms of uh, the Hongi and um, of course it was amazing to see the um, iwi leadership around the country in terms of looking after the whole order of all of the iwi at this time as well. And now I'd like to introduce our final panelists for this morning. Really wonderful to have Michael Bell here from Little Andromeda in Ōtautahi. A little bit about Michael. Michael started the Orange Studio, which is a recording studio and joint venture performance venue for artists in 2006. New Zealand Playhouse, which tours theatre into schools around New Zealand and Australia in 2009. And Little Andromeda, a joint venture theatre in Ōtautahi Christchurch in 2018. And he is joining us from Little Andromeda this morning. Kia ora, Michael. Kia ora. Um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me. So I'm, I'm in uh, Little Andromeda at the moment. Um, you can see the, the seats and the stage and the lights and so on. I'm just sitting up the back here. Um, and today I'm, uh, I guess, going to talk about a few things, um, three things uh, uh, on my agenda for discussion. Um, number one, just talking about what Little A's been up to for the last uh, uh, for the last month and um, uh, what our future plans are. Number two, um, about New Zealand Playhouse, which is that um, uh, schools touring group and kind of the challenges we've been having and. Um, uh, and what and what we're doing, and um, yeah, and and then uh, yeah, and actually, then just talk more about the challenges we've been having. That's 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 positive, positive, negative. I should have done a sandwich. I've I, I already wrote notes now, so I'm going to stick with it. Okay, so um, little late number one. Um, we have actually been open for four weeks now. Uh, we opened uh, pretty much as soon as level two was announced, and. Um, uh, hands up if you've been to the, I can't see you, uh, if, you um, if you've been to the theatre you'll know it's a hundred seat theatre and what we've done is um, we pulled all the seats apart and we pulled all the furniture in from the foyer because that was no good uh, in level two. Uh, if, if you guys can remember what level two was like, it seems like ages ago now, but um, uh, anyway, uh, we had no foyer, just even go straight in and um, we, we just put tables and chairs. We basically like moved the foyer into the thing and created a bit of a cabaret 
uh, a bit of a cabaret um, style setup. In fact, um, Francis, uh, if we could have slide number one now, please. Um, I've got, I, I can't see it, but I assume that it's up right now. So hopefully you're seeing a theater with um, with tables and chairs and they're sort of in groups of 10. And um, I called that COVID helpline because one of the issues is no one really, well, you, 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 don't, you don't book in groups of 10 to go to the theater, well, you can, but like uh, an average group size is like two. So um, they said it's all good as long as we're tracing who's sitting in each group of 10. Um, so we made these table, uh, they've been pulled down now, but um, these table setting, uh, settings, and um, you basically walk straight in and you scan at the top to sign yourself into a group of 10. And then once you've done that, you scan this one and you and you put your drink order in and then it'll just arrive to your seat. So it's, it's like a cabaret. Um, and so we did that for, um, uh for the last few weeks until it uh, came level one and um what we found is it actually went um it actually went gangbusters i w wasn't expecting uh i wasn't expecting it but just all the shows except for one just sold out really quickly and um everyone was just really happy to be back in the theater um and last weekend at level one it sold out so we just put more we put the seats out and we just put it back to um uh, our original layout, which um, uh, which is why I can't show you our level two layout today. Uh, um, we could have we could have set it up, but it was easier to put the uh, photo up. So thank you, Francis. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, one thing I have found is like you got you like taking punts on what's going to happen and um, haven't always got it right. Uh, one thing we applied for Creative New Zealand funding to. Um, uh to actually make the shows free um and to stream them so um now the reason was that if the reasoning was if we're streaming them and it's for free i was like not confident about the that we could make such an amazing stream that um you know people would want to pay for it over netflix uh, but I didn't want to de-incentivize people coming out to the theater. Um, so that was kind of the thinking. Turns out everyone just wanted to go to the theater anyway. So um, that didn't really matter. But we did actually see um, kind of new, new dem uh, demographics, like people who were coming in and, and saying they actually can't ever afford to go to shows at all. Uh, and um, so that... Uh, so that that was one of the, I suppose, successes of doing that scheme. Um, uh, in fact, when we had Little Layup in the tent in 2018 as well, we had a number of free shows and we um, uh, we uh, we saw that demographic uh, turning up as well. So I think I, th I think there is some merit in having free shows and we've been really careful with the wording saying, this is made free with thanks uh, to Creative New Zealand. So it's not like devaluing it and making people feel like it's always gonna be free and things like that. Uh, and we're already now moving back to the model where artists are choosing to do the uh, take the seventy five percent because uh, they can sell more tickets than the flat fee um, uh, would be. So uh, we're kind of tra transitioning back pretty quickly, but we are kind of tripping over ourselves to get shows up fast. Like we had our submissions in, and as soon as we knew that we could open, we were like, okay, who can do the show next week? And like someone had their show written ready to go next week, and then we had a couple more shows the week after, and you know, so we're almost back into our programming. Uh, 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 all that. Um, so in terms of the streaming, so we, we put this, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, putting um, slide number two up, please, Francis. Uh, this is our streaming setup at the back. I'm pretty, pretty pleased with it. It's, so we've got webcams all around the theater um, and one good camera at the back. And you can kind of put up, um, uh, text and uh, images and videos and stuff over the top and we've got our live mix going from the um, sound desk and so on. Um, now one thing when we've been asking artists for their submissions for our all alert level season which is totally like we're just at level one now so we're just going normally but when we were asking for our uh, all alert level season we said what is the difference going to be when um, uh, like we're not going to just stream your show like you have to say why why it matter, why someone tuning in from home is going to affect how the show happens so like them interacting 
um, on the stream or uh, for one of them we do like a music quiz so it's a performance formative quiz but there, but uh, but we've made an app that people um, can uh, participate and sort of have teams from home and send the answers in and uh, we had the competition where they'd send in the video and then we put the video on the projector here for everyone that was in the theater and so on so um, so that's been a real uh, big thing but I've been finding, um, ironically, he says on a live stream, that live streaming has been becoming less and less of a thing because I think people are more keen to, um, uh, to, to, to get out and about. So we're really not pushing the streaming on our artists uh, anymore. Thank you. I don't know if that slide's still up, but I think we're done with that one now. Um, oh, the other cool thing about that slide, you see Andrew Keppel, he was drawing, um, he was doing live drawings over the top of the, um, uh, over the top of the, uh, over the top of that show and things like that. So um, we're just really trying to play with what's possible with the stream um, and how it can affect the performance um, rather than just be a record of the performance. Uh, and, the, and the plus side now, we've got kind of cameras everywhere, so it's really easy to make recordings of shows now. So um, even when the artists don't want it streamed, um, we can still just record it and they can take it away. And so that's, a, that's kind of a, another positive to come out of that. Um, so yeah we've been finding actually so far it's been easy to get the audiences along but the hardest thing is um actually getting the shows back up and running in time um speaking of which i think that's enough about little a for now cool topic number two so nz playhouse um next hat on um this is my uh private theater company private as in like it's not a charity it's not uh it's not funded it's just a um an independent um organization and we um so we do touring schools uh we perform currently to 450 schools each year around new zealand and australia um and it's it, the 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 company we've we've worked it in a way where we actually we actually make it work with just uh, i guess selling the tickets to the schools um uh, the students um, pay five bucks and um, and we do three shows a day and we make it work. Um, so we got hit uh, pretty hard uh, by, we were just about to start the tour and had to cancel the whole thing. Um, another punt that I got wrong is uh, we said to all the schools, it looks like there's no way we're going to get to you anytime this year. Um, um, Tane was uh, right, <laughs> had, had a bit of prediction there. Um, uh, so we rescheduled everybody for 2021. And then last week when, um, when Auntie Cindy said that it's just basically do whatever you want, we were like, there's actually not really any reason that we can't get the tour back up and running this year. Because we were staring down the barrel of basically another $100,000 of expenses between now and when we could restart the tour and no income we had 50 grand in the bank like uh we we could not make it through to next april there was just simply no way um and so um i actually uh, i i wrote a um a letter to cnz asking uh for help for groups like this because it wasn't just me it was um there are a lot of uh independent organizations that aren't individual artists that get sort of a yeah um emergency response grant is that the one i can't um anyway the the the, the, the wage help and say a Hecate or Toyota group who has got the investment from cnz they're kind of in the middle where we've just got like like rent and um insurance and vehicle expenses and wages that are going to go after well, we don't know how long the wage uh, subsidies are going to go, things like that. So that was a real challenge to us. And we were basically on the brink of, we were going to let the wage subsidy run out and then go, do, are we are we just going to call it a day? It's been 12 good years. Um, and the issue is we could apply to CNZ for um, a project funding, but we but on the previous um, uh, requirements, we had to have the project finished by uh, the end of September. Um, and uh, we just like, I, I really like to think outside the box and be creative, but, um, but we just couldn't come up with like the way our company operates. We've got a product, we do an original Kiwi play every year. Um, um, like, you know, would we make video our play and give the video to the schools? Would we 
um, do like script development for our 2022 tour. Um, we, we just couldn't come up with something, I think. Um, and I do have a concern that the requirements for the next round are probably going to be that the project has to be finished by December. Thing is, we're fine now because we can, we, 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 we're going to get our tour up and running. So we're scrambling to get our tour back up and running for terms three and four. And like Tane, uh, we've also had 75% uh, of our schools um, so far say that, um, say that they're going to rebook. Um, so, so we're all good. And Little A's fine as well. It's a charity. We've got a, um, our, pro our, pr our product fits really well, I think, within what Creative New Zealand needs to see. Um, so now I'm just concerned for uh, my mates who are still struggling with their independent um, uh, 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 groups. Um, I, so I, yeah, I did write a letter. I put it on that Facebook group with all the C's and 19 brackets and the dashes and things on Facebook. Um, so if you want to read that, you can, um, you, can, uh, you, can you, you, you can see it there. I mean, I think it's, it, it's absolutely awesome that Creative New Zealand is supporting uh, so much in terms of the art. And um, I just want to keep encouraging uh, that connection of um, uh, just this sort of independent group who kind of, I think, have kind of, fall off the edge a bit because they probably applied early on got uh got turned away early on um have to build a track record fair enough build the track record work out that they can actually do the product without the assistance um and so they either go for assistance but it looks like they don't need it or they kind of don't bother um just kind of disconnected from that whole um that whole scene uh and uh, and in Christchurch, we've kind of got a double, uh, 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 it's in other cities as well, but in Christchurch, for example, we, uh, we don't have a whole lot of uh, CNZ representation down here uh, as well. So, um, so I think there is, uh, I would like to see a lot more sort of connection between uh, independent groups and, um, uh, and CNZ, so CNZ can kind of cater more to independent groups when it comes time for, um, uh, for making criteria and independent groups can feel more like they can apply. Um, I've, yeah, because I, I spoke to a, a number of my mates here in um, Autotahi saying uh, you should apply just for the wage uh, top up and they're like, oh, but I'm, but I'm a lighting designer, like, I'm, I'm not an artist. I'm like, no, no, no you, you, you totally can, you should, but I think there's a lot of, yeah, uh, I just raise, we need to raise more awareness that people, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in terms of... Uh, artists and connections. So I think I accidentally went into my third point emerged into there. So that's good. I, um, yeah, I, I, let me just, I'm just going to double check my notes. Yep. Uh, yep. That's, yeah, that's everything I uh, had to say. Um, thanks for, thanks for, thanks for bearing with me and uh, all my stuttering and ums and ahs. So uh, that's me. Thank, uh, thank you. Dennis, thank you, Michael. You made a really good point there about, you know, and it sort of um, also speaks to how we were talking about the ecosystem of the arts in terms of those organisations who are a vital part of the, the kind of the scene, but perhaps aren't um, part of the CNZ funding formula, or have been making their, their um, revenue in other ways who would have been severely affected by the lockdown period where basically we couldn't do anything. Hopefully that's really changed for many of them and they're able to get up and going quickly. But also I do know for some of those independent companies that are also planning quite far ahead, they would be thinking about 2021, not thinking about what can I do in the next, you know, before three months before September. Literally our 2020 tour, um, we've been planning for, I think it's four or five years now 2016 um we we started planning this one yeah yeah so i'm amazed always by the tenacity of those groups who are surviving on the kind of project by project based funding and the amount of work that they do for their audiences communities and the artists that they work for so thank you very much and also for sharing with us what little andromeda incredible that you've been up incredible that you've got artists who you can ring up and who are ready to do a show you know can you do a show next week that's really fantastic for, to know that there's that thriving community happening down there in Autotahi with the artists and what you've built with Little Andromeda thank you I've also got a little note in here from from one of our um, viewers who has commented on your QR codes there Michael saying so clever ah. wish that other cafes have done this too as many venues bars cafes etc haven't got easily easy QR contract traces um, going on at the moment at the moment so it's a little shout out to you there for, oh, your, cool. for your money well, have um 
Oh, can I? Uh, I'll, I'll show you. If you like QR codes, check it. I'm I'm obsessed with them. Check out our bar. We've got um, we've got QR codes for every. These these are all QR codes. These are every step of, like every task we have to do in the theatre, like rostering or, uh, anything. You'd... It's really quite fun. You're QR our, codes. You're our first panelist who's taken us on a walking tour of their organisation while we've been on. This. <laughs> That's quite exciting as well for us. Now, I've had a couple of questions come in here um, in relation to the online live streaming experiences, you know, that both Anna and Tani Mahu just spoke about as well. Um, and I might ask this question to you first, Anna, which is just could you talk about or elaborate on how you foresee that artists might monetize virtual experiences? Just because the internet has so much to offer for free, how do we place a financial value on an online arts experience? Have you guys been talking or thinking about that within ATC? Sure, well, I can I can offer to elaborate, but I don't think I've got any answers. But I do think that the questions that you are asking are what may define, um, you know, some of the answers going forward. Um, yes, we are discussing this at ATC. I, I have to say, though, I have to be very honest, the truth is we've been too focused on um, settling our business down and getting through the different levels of COVID to actually properly start to grapple with the question of how we monetize our art online or whether we should be doing that. So I don't have any answers, but something I've been um, enjoying doing is to do some reading online about the original intention of the internet. Now, uh, the, the internet surpassed its original intention um, by light years, but if we take the idea that um, it's about the democratization of space, it's about the democratization of information, um, I'm quite interested in how we would take some of that accessibility thinking into our physical spaces and what are the conversations and engagement for our audiences that we can create between physical space and online space. Um, it's very difficult to think about how to monetize um, our art on, on screen when there is so much um, on offer for free. Um, and I think, um, you know, if we think about the approach, I suppose um, what feels useful to me is, um, is intention, you know, as artists, as companies, as organisations, we have to, we have to think quite carefully about what our intent for a particular project is. And we have to think about who that may be relevant to and then how we might reach those people. So what feels um, true is that, you know, the, the approach to audience engagement and audience building is so much more layered now and so much more complex. Um, it, it's a, a much more complicated um, marketing and communication strategy to support your project now. Um, you know, Sometimes I really like the idea that um, you would protect the uh, live experience as being very special and unique by not offering anything online. And so you drive people to the live experience. Um, for other projects, it may be really relevant to draw out some of the stories or some of the kind of really interesting um, human stories around that project and offer those online. Um, and so I'm, we, we, we're interested in how the spaces talk to each other um, and what the strategies might be um, for engagement. But I think it sits around intention and it sits around uh, engagement. And, you know, I do think the online space can be a great enhancer of the live, um, of the live project or the live experience, um, there's so much more uh, insight you can give to audiences um, who 
may be really interested in the people behind the work. I also really love the idea that uh, more as a sector and more organizations, we might support each other with Kōrero online um, to help uh, drive attendance at live events and vice versa. Those are just a few random rambling thoughts on it, but it's a very, this is the very thing that we've got to grapple with. Um, and I think we all feel that we need some new business models to assist us with how to, you know, how to go forward in this space. Um, I'm really interested in uh, my, in the next generation and our digital natives. Um, that's who I want to be my boss right now. Uh, I, I, I want, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to and learning from and listening to um, our digital natives who have got a different mindset about this, about the democratization of these spaces. So I think uh, there's a lot to learn from um, people younger and with bigger brains than I. Fabulous, thank you, Anna. I was thinking about the online experiences I engaged with over the lockdown and that I still am. They really were mostly free experiences. I know the Boosted Live has a re that platform that would be really interesting for people to look into and also Trick of the Light Theatre had a very successful performance, which was a ticketed performance, I believe, through Circa Theatre as well. There's another question that's come in, which is more about how do we continue to place value on live arts experiences as free arts become increasingly available online and people are often more comfortable consuming in this way? Tani, I might come to, to you to um, share some thoughts about this as you've got your touring and you've done a lot of thinking about how to bring people back to the live experience? Um, yeah, I think it's a really good question here because um, we could get into a situation where people do feel safe, safer to want to uh, um, watch from home. And, and, and I think for me, Netflix and um, YouTube, that coming through, uh, we are, when these elements have come through, they've really shown that um, that's been a real competition for us, for live theatre um, audiences. Um, I know when we were selling Maui back in the back in two thousand and five, six, and seven, and YouTube was only really just coming through, and um, no, no Netflix at that stage. Um, and we, we we got sixty, seventy thousand in our audiences over those three years. It was just such a significant numbers. Uh, I'd go back ten years um, now to 2016, 17, 2015, when we were trying to sell to Kitani Mahuta. Much more different story trying to, to try and do that. So um, there is a massive competition where you can spend eleven, twelve dollars for um, a subscription to Netflix and get really good content, um, uh, quality materials um, on that level. Let alone the um, offerings that we've had with I, I saw the Jane Eyre, the National Theatre, as part of their um, um, offerings for free and and seeing that um, um, experience of the show. But for me, it's that whole element that. Um, even experienced Jane Eyre and seeing the, the production values of that show, um, it didn't give me the live experience, the sitting in the theatre moment, the energy of that audience and around you of what I love about live theatre. So I think that is very hard to try and create and alter that, that, that situation for someone who's not in that space. Um, maybe there's going to be virtual reality scenarios that do allow that to happen, will you feel that? Um, and I know VR's had experimentation and development and and then people moving away from it as well but I just think there's going to be still a core of our audience who want that live experience um, to be there at the moment at the time in that space with the artists and I think that's um, something where we just have to have faith that um, there will be our audiences our communities who want to have those experiences and want to be a part of something and to say I was there at that time um, of course, I think when you look at the models of the Met um, with the Opera and, and, and the National Theatre as well, how they've, um, uh, especially with the Met with the Opera, how they, they worked and did it put in cinemas. So you at least had a very strong cinematic experience of those opera works and you could go to multiple cinemas all around the world and increase the numbers who were experiencing the show um, oh, thousandfold uh, to how many would be able to see it um, in New York. That, um, that is a business model that if you've got that capacity, if you've got that quality and you've got that star power that people will come to the cinema to see your work, 
um, then that's totally an option. Um, the, but I think uh, for smaller companies or uh, independent companies, it's going to be actually kind of unique, really quirky, interesting ideas um, digitally that um, will bring people in through that space. Uh, I've been going to APAN, Trading Form Arts Market and other arts markets in the last few years. It's amazing seeing the different um, offerings that are happening through people's phones and experiences that you have with a live experience, how that combines. So um, some really interesting thinking from artists out there to participate in that um, online phone space as well as the live space at the same time um, to make um, ongoing performances viable. I mean, what's been uh, one work I saw, um, they'd filmed all the work in this um, um, house space where you'd, you'd then go around the house, use your phone um, that they provided you and see the different um, performances that have been pre-recorded through a, through, through a QR code um, as to what was happening there. A bit like when you go into the museum and getting the history tour, um, uh, the audio talked about that piece of art that you're there and it allowed thousands of people to see that performance experience Experience. And um, if you got those dancers performing that continuously a thousand times, they couldn't have done it physically. So it, would, it made that a possibility for more outreach. So I think we've just got the element of just being, um, let's be open, flexible. And I agree with Anna. I, th I think so much so much of our younger brains and younger uh, digital natives are going to have the answers there. I look at the Mighty Side Steps and what they're doing. They're set up to go as a digital company um, and, and really about to explode because they've put that focus on that uh, process as a company and they've got the team uh, around themselves to do that. That's been their focus. Um, if you don't have that type of team around you, um, I, I would think um, uh, that's just the contracting with, with the artists who had that capability to make sure that um, you've got those um, uh, different pathways available to um, providing um, different um, appetite for your, um, art, for your audiences. But in the end, just to sum up, I think, um, I don't believe that a live art experience will, will despair because we've got free stuff online. Um, and I think there's value in it and I think people will still pay for that. And, and they do, do need to because that's what makes it um, able for us to be able to um, provide um, income for our artists. Without it, we're actually live theatre is gonna, gonna disappear on us. Yeah, thank you, Tani. I think it's quite interesting when you talk about live performance and you know our concern about bringing audiences back to the theatres now, but actually perhaps we were already facing that, that mm. issue in terms of audience development. We were already in some ways struggling with a thriving industry, so many different entertainment options available for people. I'm thinking certainly, especially in Auckland, which has got a myriad of things available on any weekend possible to do. And um, yeah, I'd like to come to Michael and just ask you in terms of, you know, you said that your audiences came back uh, you know, in droves, it was it was more than you expected. Yeah. What is it about Little Andromeda in terms of your audience that you've developed over time? It sounds like it's a community. Is that how you would describe your audience, Michael? Um, yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of regulars, um, and yeah, and and yeah, a, commu a community is a much better way of saying it. You know, you see people like who see the same people each week and talk to each other at the bar and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would. Um, and as much as I'd like to take credit for the audience coming back to me, I think maybe, um, I don't know, this is, I'm just theorizing, but um, maybe it was just everybody being so sick of being at home that everyone just wanted to go somewhere and connect with people. And um, yeah, I feel pretty, uh, I feel pretty sh at, at the moment that, um, uh, yeah, that, that it could have maybe I don't know I'm really bad at predicting things but maybe maybe it's been a, maybe it's going to turn out to be a good thing and now everyone realizes how much they like going out to the theater and having that connection with um yeah just having you know obviously having ha having having that having that uh, connection with the artist um I'm also really bad at predicting things but here's another prediction if I'm wrong then can we just quietly delete this video but if I'm right then let's um uh, save it I feel that artists, like at the moment, um, you know, like we don't earn the same sort of amounts as like lawyers and doctors and things like that. But uh, as robots kind of slowly take over everybody's jobs, um, I think artists are probably going to be uh, suddenly become the last ones actually employed um, because, uh, yeah, so maybe, I mean, who knows, maybe the future will be good for artists. Like I say, delete this video if I'm wrong. But Thank yeah. you, Michael. And actually, on that point, I'd like to come to each of you just for a closing thought about artists. And you talked about that um, Eleanor came to you guys with an artistic idea. 
which you picked up for the lockdown. And Tani, you've been talking about how artists have been coming up with such innovative ideas all the time. In fact, they are our change makers. How are you, your organisations, just for a closing thought from each of you, how are your organisations planning to perhaps deal or have a relationship with artists in different ways, just from some of your reflections over the time of the lockdown? I'll start with you, Anna. Well, I love your prediction, Michael, that artists, we're going to be the last one standing. Woohoo! I think that's a great prediction. I think this video is going on. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's a time for it's a time for great collaboration between all of us. Um, we're in a process at ATC of opening up our company. Um, we started to work um, more specifically in partnership with other companies, with Prayas Theatre Company, with Tirihia Theatre Company in 2019. And ATC over its 27 year history has a long history of collaborating with other companies. And But I think we're in a new time now where, uh, you know, we have these, um, we have these different uh, technologies and these different platforms that we can use in our experimentation with the Seagull collaboration um, showed us that it was an extraordinary experiment. Um, it was incredibly quick to turn that around to respond to a really fantastic idea. And in that collaboration, we had external artists coming to us to say, hey, how about it? And we put the resource to it and made that happen. The results were really extraordinary and it was so fantastic to be able to share that collaboration and the success of that collaboration, both for Auckland Theatre Company, but beyond the company um, with the world. And we got some um, international critical response in the Scotsman from that collaboration which was titled up, you know, what are the five best things to watch on uh, on the screen at the moment. So little old ATC was name checked in there amongst Complicité and um, National Theatre of Scotland and other, you know, really incredible producers. So it was a very proud moment for the whole company and for that company of um, actors that we brought together. So, uh, we're open to more of that, uh, and it's a it's an exciting time. I just wanted to reflect back as well, uh, just to the discussion we were just having. Um, you know, these questions about audience engagement online—they're the same questions we had and we're having before the time of COVID. It's no different. It's just that there's a there's a heavier reliance now and a comfort zone for people uh, participating in the online space. So what we do about that, what we do with it, is, it's up to us. Um, I agree with Tane, I don't think, um, I don't think as, um, as an industry, as a sector, um, it's gonna mean that we're having less people to our live performances. Um, I feel hopeful like we're going to have more and that our collaborations together as companies, as organisations and with our artists are getting more interesting, more dynamic and more complex. Kia ora, thank you, Anna. Michael, I'll come to you next. Oh, oh, oh there we go, I'm muted. Um, the, um, you uh, reminded me of... Uh, um, uh, another just we thing on this digital uh, 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 versus theatre thing is um, I, just a wee anecdote. May, may I share an anecdote? Yes, please. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, um, so over I, I think pretty, pretty much over lockdown. So, like, like I'm I'm 32. I'm on TikTok. Uh, my workmates feel quite passionately that um, I'm too old to be on TikTok. But anyway, it is for a uh, is it has got a lot of younger people on a lot of people on there and um, and Joe Damon who uh, is a, a comedian in Auckland has uh, I suppose risen to TikTok fame over uh, over 
uh, particularly over lockdown, making videos where he's like having chats with Jacinda Ardern and stuff like that. And um, it's awesome. Now, after lockdown, he's gone and done this tour. So he's doing Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch. And he announced it last week. And the tickets, all three centres just went within an hour. And we will put more shows on. And they all went like that. So he's got this amazing sold out theatre tour now. Um, and I think, and yeah, I'm, I, I swear it's um, thanks to this, you know, TikTok, um, you know, uh, 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 project he's had uh, going on, huge, just huge following. And so we're expecting, um, you know, sort of 20 to 22 year olds uh, coming this week. We're going to take all the craft beer out and put RTDs in the fridge. And um, but I think it's um, same with like um, Tom Sainsbury, um, you know, uh, uh, Snapchat fame um, and just uh, really is, is able to actually transfer that digital like it's free but that kind of into theatre um, success uh, sales success so um, I don't know there's a that's my anecdote um, Thanks, Michael yeah. that is a great point and I have I have enjoyed that comedian's TikToks I'm not I'm not on TikTok but I've you know, <laughs> seen them someone did a news okay. I think you should be it's okay <laughs> <laughs> Tani, I'll come to you finally, just for a final thought about how's your organisation changing the, or what's, what's it changed or learned about ways to perhaps work with artists? Um, I think the, um, for us, um, and it's, I think it's a good challenge for us at Takedo as well, that um, in some ways uh, the type of theatre we have been doing a lot has um, been a little bit um, or possibly a bit conservative in terms of the, and safe and the way that um, standard um, theatre has been presented. And I think it's put a, a word or to us to be more um, ambitious in terms of the different types of um, 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 artistic um, collaborations that we can play with um, that, uh, that go beyond um, straight theatre space um, or performance in schools and how do we uh, bring technology into it. So I think the, we have been um, looking at works and potentials for that to come through but we haven't um, actually um, delved into and, and made that step but it gives us more uh, confidence to go and do this especially with the, um, uh, when you do see it, I mean I, I follow Tom Sainsbury's too, it's just brilliant, his Snapchats are just so funny and um, really clever ways um, and I've been watching how uh, I'm not a TikTok, um, haven't got on my phone, but I'm watching my partner's phone and watching the different clips and just realize, my gosh, the cleverness of people and how to build a, a community very quickly has been really impressive to see how that works. So um, I think there's, um, we could do a lot more in that, um, for me, it's humor in the digital line. And that's where you, for me, we really get a, um, a, a great, um, um, uh, growth and um, connection with so many more people. I think Tyker's showed that so strongly. Um, I decided to the same. Um, that's been a big part of um, what's really grabbed um, audiences to, to come and experience them digitally and then they'll come and experience their live works or uh, build their brand further as in Tyker's journey, which has been phenomenal where he's grown to. So um, the, I think we can, um, noting that there's more complexity of what we um, end um, an opportunity to be more artistically um, uh, varied in terms of our offerings. That's uh, the wheel for us. Um, but also kind of noting that there is an element, and I, I, I talk, think to Taika as well, uh, when um, the Untold Tales of Maui was done in 2003, and thinking actually theatre companies do provide a really strong base uh, for people to try their craft, develop it through, uh, and, and grow that base from where um, people can then launch off um, into the other um, career pathways. And um, and I, I look at Bats and uh, look at Takedua and, and, and Circa and, um, and, and the previous downstage as well, uh, in Wellington and how those platforms have helped launch a lot of artists' careers in a lot of different directions and ways. So as long as we've still got some strong platforms for people to then to launch off and then go the own way, then our arts um, ecology and Aotearoa is, is going to always be exciting and, and really pushing the envelope. So provide that platform, that space for our independent artists to, to go for it. That'll be um, a key part of the platform that we want to keep presenting for our whānau. Thank you, Tani. And that brings us to a close of our hui today. Thank you very much to everyone out there who's joined us, everyone who may be watching this later, and a huge mihi to our panellists from today. Thank you so much, Anna, Tani Mahuta, and Michael, for everything you've shared today. Ngā mihi. This will be the last online panel for a little while. We're not going away, but we will be moving to a monthly model, so we will see you 
next month in July for our next online hui. And if there are any special announcements or any special panels that may happen before then, certainly we will be keeping you informed with the phase two of the Creative New Zealand Emergency Response. And we'll, we'll be um, look forward to having another hui with you all and sharing more information, knowledge and ideas. As you say, Tane, we have a plethora, a country full of exceptional artists and we're very excited to be at level one to be able to get back out there and share their work with audiences across the Motu and one day hopefully again internationally. So I'll close our hui uh, with a karakia. Firstly, just like to again thank Auckland Live and PANS and the big idea for their support with these hui and a shout out to our behind the scenes team of Francis, Heather, Helena and Louise. Nga mahi kia koto. So just to close the session today, a karakia. Me karakia tato. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu te moana, kia tere te kairohi rohi i mua i tō huarahi. Thank you so much for your time today. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā ratatou katoa.